Okay, this is our final topic and final video in Math 5, and the subject of this video is isomorphisms, which are invented to solve a problem which we've actually already mentioned briefly in Math 5, which is this. Let's look at two vector spaces. The first is r cubed. So a typical element in r cubed will be a column vector of height 3 with three real number entries, by x and y and z. And another vector space is the vector space of width 3 row vectors with real number entries. So a typical element in there would be a row vector with three real number entries, x and y and z. So these things are not the same vector space. They're different vector spaces. Their elements look different. Um, but they are in some sense the same vector space. So um, they both just consist of... Um, elements which are made up of three independent real numbers which you add and scale and multiply one element at a time, coordinate-wise. So while they're not equal as vector spaces, they do share all the same vector space properties, like their dimension, for example. They both have dimension 3. So can we make the precise this idea of two vector spaces being different but being essentially the same as vector spaces, if you just think about their vector space properties? The answer is yes, and the way we do it is through the concept of an isomorphism of vector spaces. And the definition of a vector space isomorphism or isomorphism of vector spaces is a vector space isomorphism is a linear map which is a bijection. So just putting together two concepts you've already seen. So as our simple example, we will use the thing we saw on the last slide. So f is going to be a function from r cubed to the space of row vectors of width 3 with real entries given by the transpose map. So f is just going to be the transpose map. f of um, uh, a vector x is going to be x transpose. Uh, this is a linear map. The transpose is always a linear map and it's a bijection. So f is linear and a bijection. So let's just check one of the parts of the definition of being a bijection. Let's check uh, being one-to-one -one because it's going to be really easy to do once you write out that definition. So if f of a, b, c is equal to f of d, e, f, then what does that tell you? a, b, c, this row vector is equal to d, e, f, this other row vector. So a equals D, B equals E, C equals F, and therefore A, B, C is equal to the column vector D, E, F. All right, so we've shown um, injectivity. That's the definition of injectivity. If F of A, B, C is equal to F of D, E, F, then actually the two column vectors A, B, C and D, E, F must be equal. So this was an... Um, this is an injectivity proof, so f is injective, and in fact, similarly, it's dead easy to see that it is onto, and it is linear because uh, the transpose is always uh, linear. That's just a standard property of the transpose map. So this is an example of an isomorphism. Now, when we have an isomorphism between two vector spaces, so if we've got an isomorphism from a vector space V to a vector space W, then we say that V and W are isomorphic, and we write v and then this symbol which is an equal symbol with a wiggly line on the top and then w that means that v and w are isomorphic so what we've just shown is that r cubed is isomorphic to m1 by 3 of r okay um, so that's the definition of an isomorphism and the notation that we use and we're now going to show an interesting property of injective linear maps so remember the definition of injectivity, so a function um, f from a set x to a set y is injective or one-to-one -one if and only if for all x and x prime in x you have that if f of x equals f of x prime then x is equal to x prime. So that's the definition of injectivity. And I claim there's a nice connection between injectivity and the kernel of a linear map, specifically that a linear map is injective if and only if its kernel contains only the zero vector in its domain. So let's do a proof of this. 
So let's suppose first of all that um, the kernel of t is the zero vector. So we'll suppose that t of u is equal to t of v for some vectors u and v belonging to our vector space capital V. So then well, if I do a bit of subtraction I get that t of u minus t of v is the zero vector in w. So um, because t is linear that's the same as t of u plus t of minus v and again because lin t is linear that's the same as t of u minus v. So the thing on the left um, u minus v must be an element of the kernel of v of t. And the kernel was just the zero vector so u minus v must be equal to the kernel to the um, zero vector and therefore adding v to both sides u is equal to v all right we've shown that if t of u is equal to t of v then u must be equal to v that is injectivity for our linear map uh, so now we need to do the converse which is that we have to suppose that um, t is injective and then prove that its kernel is just the zero vector so now suppose T is injective. And we'll suppose that K is an element of the kernel of T. Uh, so what we're going to have to prove is that actually K must be the zero vector. So on the one hand we know that T of K is the zero vector in W. That's what it means for K to be in the kernel. But what else do we know about um, this linear map T? Well, when we proved that kernels and images were subspaces, we had to use a lemma which, we, which says that any linear map sends the zero vector in its domain to the zero vector in its codomain. So what do we have now? We have T of K is equal to T of the zero vector. And since we're assuming that T is injective, that tells us k is equal to the zero vector in v. Right, we've proved that every element of the kernel is actually equal to the zero vector, so the only thing in the kernel is the zero vector. All right, we're done. We've um, proved the result that we wanted to prove. Um, let's just fence that off from the other part um, because we're now going to prove that... Um, I'm going to prove a result which illustrates what I was saying about isomorphic vector spaces having all the same vector space properties. So we'll prove that if u is isomorphic to v, then actually they have the same dimension. So this is, uh, we'll take u to be, um, u and v to be isomorphic, and then we'll prove that their dimension is equal using the rank nullity theorem. So here is our proof of this. Well, if u is isomorphic to v, there is an isomorphism between them. So let's f from u to v be an isomorphism. It's a linear map which is a bijection. So let's think about its kernel and its image. So f is injective. If it's an isomorphism it's a bijection. If it's a bijection it's injective. So the kernel of f is equal to just the zero vector. All right, so the dimension of the kernel of f is zero because the kernel of f is just the zero vector. Right, what else can we say? f is onto. So the image of f is all of v. Right, let's plug those things into the rank nullity theorem. So the rank nullity theorem says that the dimension of the kernel of f, what's that? That's zero. Plus the dimension 
of the image of f, uh, what's that? That is the dimension of v, because the image of f was equal to v, is equal to the dimension of the domain of f, so dimension of u. Okay, what do I have? 0 plus the dimension of v equals the dimension of u, and that is what we wanted to prove. So there we go. Um, we've proved that if two vector spaces are isomorphic, they've got the same dimension. We're now going to look at um, a kind of strange thing about that notation. We, kept, we used this notation um, u and then this symbol and then v to mean that they were isomorphic. And that's a bit like an equality symbol. And the thing about equality is that if a equals b, then b ought to be equal to a. So we should hope for a similar property for isomorphisms. If u is isomorphic to v, then v should be isomorphic to u. Or here I've got v and w. If v is isomorphic to w, then w should be isomorphic to v. So if v is isomorphic to w, that means there is uh, an isomorphism, an invertible linear map from v to w. So if we want w to be isomorphic to v, we need an invertible linear map from w to v. And there's an obvious candidate for that, which is that since t is invertible, t inverse would go from w to v. And for sure, t inverse is invertible because its inverse is t. But what we don't know is that t inverse is linear. So we need to prove this. We have to prove that um, if t is an invertible linear map, then its inverse is also invertible. So that's the thing we need to prove here. We must show T inverse is linear. So T inverse goes from W to V. So let's pick two elements of W. So let's call them X and Y, the elements of W. And I'd like to show that um, the additivity property from linearity. I want to show that T inverse of X plus Y is T inverse of X plus T inverse of Y. And to help me, I'm going to use the fact that T is onto, so actually X is equal to T of something in V, and same for Y. So X is equal to T, let's say Y, um, because uh, T is onto, x is equal to t of something in v, and y is equal to t of something in v. Okay, now t inverse of x plus y is equal to t inverse of t of a, uh, let's start a new line there, plus t of b. All right, now we don't yet know that t inverse is linear, that's what we're trying to prove, but we do know that t is linear. So we could rewrite this as t inverse of t of a plus b. All right, now you've got t inverse of t of something, T inverse composed with T is the identity, so this is just A plus B. Okay, but let's just take a look at what we've got here. Okay, look at this thing, and do, um, do T inverse to both sides. So if you do two T inverse to both sides, then what you'll get is T inverse of X is equal to A. Okay, so continuing then, similarly, t inverse of y will be equal to b. So what we have here is t inverse of x plus t inverse of y. Right, we have checked the first, um, well, one of the linearity properties. We've checked that t inverse of x plus y is equal to t inverse of x plus t inverse of y for any x and y in w. So for the second linearity property, let's do um, the scalar multiples property. So now let's let uh, lambda be a scalar and x be any element of w. I've got to show that t inverse of lambda x is the same as lambda times t of x. That's the second linearity property, the other linearity property. Um, so again, t is onto, so 
what can we say because of this? x is equal to t of a for some a in v. So if I just look at t inverse of lambda x, that's going to be t inverse of lambda times t of a. And again, t is a linear map. So because t is a linear map, because we know this already, we can write this as t of lambda a inside, um, inside the function t inverse. So now you've got t inverse of t of something, t inverse composed with t is the identity, so this is lambda a, and just like before, that's the same as lambda times t inverse of x. So we've shown that for any lambda, for any x in w, t inverse of lambda x is the same as lambda times t inverse of x. So that finishes our proof because it shows that actually uh, t inverse is a linear map. So why do we care? Why do we care about this result? The reason is if um, v is isomorphic to w, then t, there must be a linear map. So there must be an isomorphism t from v to w. And what we've just shown is that t inverse from w to v is also an isomorphism. So, w is isomorphic to v. So what this is saying is that isomorphism has a similar property to equality. Right? If a is equal to b, then b is equal to a. And we've now shown that if two vector spaces v and w have the property that v is isomorphic to w, then also w is isomorphic to v. So this is useful for us um, because it tells us that isomorphism has a nice property. It's a bit like equality because it has a similar property to equality. Okay. Um, right. Now, the final thing we're going to prove is this result, which I remember when I learned it for the first time in, in lectures a long time ago, I thought was really disappointing because it tells you that finite dimensional vector spaces are actually, in some sense, they're not very interesting because they're all just isomorphic to a certain space of column vectors. So column vectors are actually, um, they're kind of universal in the sense that every finite dimensional vector space is just isomorphic to some space of column vectors. Um, I don't know if you find this disappointing or not. I certainly did. I'm going to prove it anyway so you can be disappointed too. So here we go. Um, we have a vector space V of dimension n and I'm claiming that f to the n is isomorphic to V. So I'm going to prove this by um, writing down an isomorphism from f to the n to V. Um, uh, well, how do we start? Um, we know that V is a vector space with dimension n, so it's got a basis of size n. So we'll choose some, some such basis. So V1 up to Vn be a basis of uh, V. We're now going to define uh, a, a function T from F to the N to V by, so elements of F to the N are column vectors of height N with entries from the field F. So we're going to find this to be the sum of Xi times Vi, where that sum goes from 1 to n. So we send a vector of x1 up to xn to a linear combination, x1 times v1 plus x2 times v2, and so on. So that is our function t. Um, then what I claim is that t is linear. OK, uh, I'm not going to do this. You should check that. Uh, you should check this. You can find, um, once you've done it, um, you can check your answer. Um, you can verify your proof by looking at the uh, lecture notes for Math 5, which has got this linearity check written down. Um, it's also on to. So why is it on to? Um, if you have any element in V, then since V1 up to Vn is supposed to be a basis, in particular, it's a spanning sequence. So every element of V can be written as a linear combination of V1 up to Vn. So V is equal to a sum of Xi Vi for some 
x1 up to xn in f. So v is equal to t of x1 down to xn. Right, we have proved that every element of v is in the image of our function t, so our function t is on to. And finally, it's injective, one to one. And the reason it's injective is that if you had that, let's say, t of x1 down to xn, if that was equal to t of y1 down to yn, well then you get that the sum of the xi vi's is equal to the sum of the yi vi's. So I can rearrange this, I can collect together the coefficient of v1 and v2 and v3 and so on, and when I do that I get that the sum of the xi minus yi times vi's is going to be equal to the zero vector, uh, zero vector in v. Right, but v1 up to vm was supposed to be a basis, and bases are linearly independent. So by linearly, linear independence, xi is equal to yi for, well, let's spell this out, xi minus yi is equal to zero for all i, so in other words, xi equals yi for all i, and therefore x1 down to xn is the same as y1 down to yn. Right, so if t of x1 up to xn is equal to t of y1 up to yn, then actually those two column vectors must be equal. That's one to oneness. So we've shown that our function f, our function t rather, is linear and it is a bijection, so it's an isomorphism. Okay, so we've, um, we've done this. We've shown that uh, if you've got any vector space v of dimension n, uh, then f to the n is isomorphic to v. And of course, what we saw on the previous slide, um, also uh, that tells us that v is isomorphic to fn. Um, you can use this symbol either way around, as we've seen previously. So in fact, what this tells you, um, using composition of bijections is a bijection, it tells you that if you've got any two vector spaces with the same finite dimension n, then actually they have to be isomorphic as vector spaces.